Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Anthony Chang. Um, we have another AI Med talk this morning, a very special guest who we've known for quite some time, actually since the uh, very beginning of all of the AI medicine meetings. Uh, Jerry, Jeremy Howard's been a huge uh, supporter from the beginning. Had the pleasure of actually hosting him at my own hospital, and we had a really amazing uh, day for him to see the inside of a children's hospital. And I think at least what he's told me that um, it's really affected how he looked at healthcare and really an admirer of um, Jeremy for his transitioning to be more involved in healthcare and couldn't be happier that he's more involved. So, Jeremy, um, welcome. Tell us about Thanks. your recent foray into uh, healthcare with your data science background. Sure. Well, uh, I've been had a bit of a focus on on medicine uh, for the last, gosh, I don't know, six years or something. Um, starting with a company I founded called Enlytic, which was the first company to focus on deep learning for medicine, and um, specifically was looking at radiology um, applications of deep learning. Um, and then. Um, more recently, uh, I helped set up a, a research lab called WAMRI, which is focused on, on academic research around that area, which is applying AI to, to medicine. And uh, that's all about collaborating with various academic medical hospitals like um, Stanford and UCSF and Harvard and others are all folks we work with a lot. Um, part of uh, what I focus on, though, is kind of the intersection of data science and ethics. Uh, so there's a kind of a strong ethics part of all the stuff that I teach. And um, one of the things we kind of say to, to our, uh, our people doing our courses is, you know, hey, don't just do the research and the analysis, but, but turn it into actions. So, uh, so actually, that's very much happened over the last bit over a month. I actually taught a lesson on kind of evidence and data and how that kind of supports policy decisions moving beyond like p-values, but more into kind of integrated <laughs> holistic, probabilistic reasoning. And the lesson I actually did, I decided um, to look at mask usage for COVID-19. Um, and I was really surprised to discover that actually the evidence base for suggesting that everybody should wear masks was actually really, really strong. And the size of the practical impact seemed to be really, really high. Uh, as somebody who had never really worn a mask myself, this was not really what I was expecting to find. So I actually, uh, yeah, kind of taught a, a lesson about this and I ended up making it publicly available. And then the weird, then something really weird happened, which was it's kind of people outside my immediate AI community started noticing it. And a couple of days later, a reporter from, uh, sorry, a editor from the Washington Post contacted me and asked if I could write an article mm -hmm. about about this research, about this topic. It's fantastic. So putting your vast um, data science knowledge into Healthcare policy has been an amazing transition. I've blessed to have seen well, the same yeah. transition. Yeah, I mean, it's turned out to require very different skills because what happened yeah. was so I, I, I wrote this article and luckily I've got some friends who have written a lot of op-eds for big newspapers. And so they were able to help me make it much better than it would have otherwise. Uh, so yeah. I kind of throughout this, I've been leveraging the expertise of others. Um, and so the Washington Post piece was the first article in the English speaking media to push for mask usage. And um, so that was kind of a pretty surprising message for a lot of people. And so suddenly I started getting calls and I found myself on Good Morning America and on Lightline and on MSNBC, on Joy <laughs> Reid and Steve Cavuto. And like suddenly I was on, on all these big national TV shows. <laughs> yeah, the, the, you know, I was suddenly I was a mask guy. And um, it was really weird because, you know, at each time people would be saying like, look, what do you think about masks? And I'd be like, well, <laughs> you know, I'm just a data scientist, so I can just tell you what the data says. And the data strongly suggests that if we all wear masks, we can, you know, we'd have 
far less deaths and we can open the, up the economy more quickly and I don't know why we're not doing it. Um, and so the, the, so then what happened was uh, I got put in touch with a senator, uh, a US senator who was like, wanted to have a call. So I had a call with him and was like, what, <laughs> tell me what you found. And I, t I told him. Yeah. And he was like, um, oh, sorry about that. And and he was like, well, we've got to do something about this. So the next day, he did a video which he put out on Twitter saying, like, wearing a mask and saying, like, I want everybody in my state wearing masks, please. This is important. And then a Democratic senator, so this guy's Republican, so a Democratic senator was like, hey, we've got to make this a bipartisan thing. So he reached out to me and then he did the same thing the next day. And then both of their teams were like, okay, can you brief uh, 10 Senate officers on this topic? And so I found myself doing that. And then that turned into a briefing that I um, uh, kind of, I briefed this, a, a Senator who then briefed the key guy at the CDC, and then who then also briefed Donald Trump. And so the next thing I know, Donald Trump is getting asked in the press conference, should people be wearing masks? And uh, he was like, yep, they probably should, you know, wear a scarf, whatever, it's fine. So that was cool. Um, yeah, and then I, I kind of found well, myself, so for the last month, I've basically been a full-time advocate of like trying to set up digital campaigns and politicians briefings. And so that, you know, the data science, uh, you know, kind of took a back seat to advocacy but I guess yeah. kind of advocacy on the back of the data science, you know. Well, we're even more glad you're in that role in healthcare. How do you explain it during your journey that um, even the CDC wasn't advocating wearing masks for such a long time and all yeah. of the Asian countries were doing it. Um, almost every individual you see on TV is wearing a mask. How do you, yeah. how do you reconcile the delay? Yeah. So I've learned a lot about this, as you can imagine. And the, the history and the sociology and the politics of it is really interesting. So we've now got to a point where of the 12 largest countries by GDP, 11 of them recommend or require masks. The only yeah. one that doesn't is the UK, right. which apparently their scientists are now saying they should change and they're finding trying to find a way to do yeah. that without losing face. Um, so it turns out that um, Western doctors have historically not reacted well to public health measures. Um, so the first time we see this, or one of the key times we see this is the hand washing. So the guy that um, discovered that hand washing can save lives um, was um, mocked and then ignored um, uh, following his discovery. Uh, and, and, you know, doctors were offended. The idea that, that these gentlemen doctors were too dirty you know, and that was killing people was just not okay. So this guy, Semmelweis, actually, he went mad before <laughs> seeing his <laughs> advice eventually taken up. Um, but eventually, you know, over many years, the evidence was too obvious and people eventually got on, to, you know, got onto the idea that, okay, we should wash our hands. But that was very, very controversial. Like, it, like not just controversial, it made people very angry. And when we saw the same thing with masks um, in the, early 20th century with the Manchurian flu, or the Manchurian plague, I guess I should say. Uh, and the Manchurian plague was uh, hugely deadly. And it was actually a Chinese Malaysian doctor who um, discovered that wearing a mask, a simple cloth, uh, cotton mask can make a huge difference. And he got the same reaction, you know, of contempt, anger, you know, um, and, uh, you know, even though his research was, was super solid, uh, and he kind of got in this rather public argument with a French doctor who was like, I'm not wearing a mask, you know, this is ridiculous. Um, and then, you know, classic narrative, um, the French doctor died of Manchurian plague. <laughs> so <laughs> that- Well, it's almost like this addition of weakness or uh, um, some strange uh, mental coupling to being a criminal or have to be in hiding. I don't know, maybe. It reminds me a bit of like what happened with Boris Johnson, you know, being shown shaking hands with COVID-19 patients and saying like everything's fine and then he's in the hospital. So anyway, after that actually, um, 
things for quite a while changed in the West. People actually looked at this guy, uh, Dr. Fu, as a bit of a champion, and uh, uh, and people used his mask design all around the world. And uh, uh, masks were globally a thing for respiratory pandemics. But then there were no respiratory pandemics, much to speak of, in the West for decades. Um, but there were lots in around Asia and East Asia in particular. So East Asia and communities didn't forget Dr. Fu's discovery. Uh, sorry, Dr. Yeah. Wu. Which is Dr. Wu's discovery. Um, uh, but in the West, we did. So now we finally are having our, you know, our first big respiratory pandemic, I guess, for, for many decades. Yeah. And we've forgotten about the importance of wearing respiratory protection in a respiratory pandemic. And uh, we're having to go through it all again. Such a simple thing, yeah. Yeah, and ironically, where we even ran out of masks for a while in in, in the U.S. So, but then there yeah, was like panic. Right? panic we, we we yeah. didn't because the the problem here is the um, doctors have the science of this backwards, right? Because doctors, as you well know, um, learn about PPE. They learn about um, uh, you know a well fitted N95 rated respirator to protect yep. themselves when they're around sick people. But actually the science of mask wearing for community transmission is the exact opposite. It turns out that this virus is uh, you know, significantly spread when we speak, yawn, sing, whatever, little droplets come out of our mouth. They're so small, you can't see them. And those droplets are big enough to be caught by any kind of fabric pretty much. So if you put a bit of t-shirt material or a hanky or a scarf over your face, it stops about 99% of those droplets. But then um, I worked with a, um, uh, aerosol chemistry expert in the Czech Republic who who showed how, um, I mean, this, this has been known for a long time, but he explained how those droplets evaporate almost instantly when they come out of your mouth and they turn into China, tiny droplet nuclei. And that's why you need, when you're doing procedures, the, the carefully fitted, you know, specially woven N95 respirators, because that's what you need to capture the tiny right. particles. But to capture it on the way out when they're big, much bigger droplets is yeah. easy. So yeah. so actually, if you tie any piece of fabric around your face, this is actually what's necessary to slow down transmission. Yeah. But it, it caused a lot of confusion because every time a doctor was asked by the media, what kind of masks do people need? How do they, you know, then they, of course, fed back what they learned at medical school, which is it's got to be a special kind of mask. It's got to be specially fitted. Donning and doffing procedures are special, you know, which is actually not correct uh, right. when we talk about, um, it's called source control, which is stopping people yeah. from transmitting the virus. What about your eyes, Jeremy? Have you come into discussion about, because your eye membranes are also susceptible to right. getting- so again, that's kind of, that's, that's, that's wearer protection. So, um, the, the, so the key thing I focused on is source control, which is stopping an infected person from infecting right. others. Okay. So about 40 to 50, 50, so this is where the kind of the data and the science comes in. So about 40 to 50% of infections come from people who don't know they're infected um, because they are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. Um, and so if you're walking around in the community without any face covering, you might be killing people without knowing it. and the, the droplets come out of your mouth, not out of your eyes, not out of your nose. So to stop the transmission, it's the mouth we need to cover. The, yeah. Then the other bits is, you know, an extra bonus to give yourself additional protection. Um, yeah. But, you know, the, really the thing we're focusing on is like, get the R beneath zero, the reproduction rate sorry, beneath one, get the reproduction rate beneath one. And to do that, yeah. we need to get good source control. And to do that, we need people covering their mouths. Um, yeah. So one of the things I did to kind of uh, help move this along, you know, I started getting pushback from uh, government folks I spoke to saying, hey, we spoke to our science advisors and they said the science isn't clear. I just, yeah. you know, fair enough. That's a great answer. I mean, if you're going to say no, that's a good reason to say it. So I actually um, thought, well, let's make the science clear. So I put together a group of 19 experts, cross-disciplinary, international and we wrote a review of the evidence um, and published that. And so that was one of the key things which has helped quite a bit is now we can say to people, okay, here is a yeah. international- Jeremy, where is, that where is that published? So our readers and listeners can- So uh, it's still it on preprints, unfortunately still waiting to get 
accepted okay. and peer reviewed, which takes so long yeah. at the moment. It's That's crazy. another discussion. You know. <laughs> yeah. Information uh, should not be held up too long. But if so. you go to if you go to fast.ai, um, I actually wrote a summary of it along with Professor uh, Trish Greenholt, who is a um, UK uh, uh, Oxford University professor who actually okay. literally wrote the book on evidence-based yeah. healthcare. And so yeah. her and I have prepared there a, a, a summary of the science yeah. and, and links to the key papers and so forth. Well, as usual, Jeremy, I can talk to you for um, hours about things that from your perspective, as you know, we're a huge fan of yours and especially now that you're really mainstream healthcare, welcome to the club and thank you for your um, transition from your previous role. I've known you since the days of analytic and to yeah. this day, it's just been a special privilege to see your involvement and thank you for that. So thank you. Uh, we'll look forward to having you in the future. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. Nice to be here.